when we have reversible reactions, some reactions uh, generally can only go one direction um, for a variety of reasons. But uh, many reactions can go both directions, two different directions. So we have reactants form products, and then when we have enough products, the products will react to form reactants. So that's a reversible reaction. We show a reversible reaction with a double-sided arrow when we want to explore this properties. A uh, single-sided arrow does not mean it's not reversible. This means we're not interested in reverse reaction. So with the double-sided arrow, we're showing that it um, is a reversible reaction. So it can, its end position, what it's aiming for, is the equilibrium position. So equilibrium is the low energy position of a chemical reaction. And the world likes to go downhill for energy. So the world's trying to get to equilibrium because that's the low energy position for that reaction. And um, so for the example here of solutions, aqueous solutions, uh, the lowercase letter is the coefficient, the capital letter is the compound. So the law of mass action allows us to write a equilibrium expression of these reversible reactions. A constant, the equi equilibrium constant is equal to uh, the product of each product raised to its coefficient divided by the product of each reactant raised to its coefficient. So for this generic reaction here, our two products are C and D. So it would be C raised to the coefficient C, D raised to the coefficient D, divided by the reactant A raised to the coefficient of A and B raised to the coefficient of B. I'm showing this with square brackets. Square brackets means molarity. So our constant, we like to use uh, atmospheres for pressure, uh, molarity for solutions, and our solids and pure liquids do not show up in our equi equilibrium constant. Uh, they do not have a concentration that can change. Uh, so if their presence is acknowledged, it's just wrapped into the constant itself and is not left into the expression. We call it a constant, but this equilibrium constant changes with temperature. It may increase or decrease depending on um, with the increase in temperature, depending on whether it's an exothermic or endothermic reaction. We'll come back to that and look at that in a separate video. Our equilibrium constant is unitless. We're writing this as having molarities. We'll be writing with pressures also. But there we do a trick uh, that we show you in physical chemistry where we make these units go away and it leaves the equilibrium constant as a unitless property. So we do not write units for our equilibrium constant. We do not have to worry about them. And um, we can write this equilibrium constant just as K, and that is totally appropriate. It's a capital K, not a lowercase K. Or we can use subscript to describe either the constant or the reaction. So we can write it without a K. We can write it as a K sub EQ for equilibrium. If it's a K sub C, that means it's concentration. That means we're doing uh, molarity specifically. And we can do molarity for gas or solution. In the natural form, we like to do molarity only for solution and pressure for gases. But we don't have to keep the natural form. We can do some other forms also. Uh, a subscript of a P means pressure. This can only be done for gases. A subscript of A is an acid disassociation reaction. I'll have an example of that um, coming up. Subscript B is a base disassociation reaction. I'll, I'll have an example of that. A subscript F is for formation constant, um, for formation of complex ion. Uh, I will have an example of that. Subscript W is for water disassociation reaction. And we'll come back to that um, when we look at acids more specifically. Uh, a subscript of a SP is solubility product. This is for 
solubility of ionic compounds into water. So these subscripts are for types of reactions. The KCKP is specifically talking about the constant is, the EQ is general and the K is general. So I'll go through a series of examples. So silver ion reacting with ammonia is forming a complex ion. We'll come back to this near the end of the semester. Um, so the, this is actually a Lewis acid based reaction. The silver ion is acting as a Lewis acid. Uh, the ammonium with the lone pair on it is acting like a Lewis base and it forms this complex ion. So, oh, I didn't write that uh, down, but uh, this could be written as KF. But again, it's the products of reactants. So our complex ion over the two reactants, silver and then ammonium squared. Another reaction here, oxygen gas reaction with um, steam. And this is a, oh, I messed up this one. Uh, I messed this one up. I was copying from a bad source and I will ignore that one. I will come, I will have more examples of pure gases. So that was just a bad reaction. So let me switch boards. So here we have uh, ammonia gas. We heat it up high enough and it'll decompose to nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas. The equilibrium expression for this, uh, since it's all gases, we could write it as Kp. We don't have to, uh, just K. Um, and the natural form is in pressure. So we have P for pressure. So our products, a pressure of N2 times the pressure of H2 cubed divided by the pressure of NH3 squared. Uh, this is the Kp. We could, for gas, we could also do Kc. The natural form is in Kp. The natural form, all gases should be pressure. Sometimes for convenience sake, we write it as a moles per liter, a molarity. Um, we will practice converting between these two in a separate video. So here's one, ammonium chloride. Um, it decomposes to form some ammonium gas, ammonia gas and hydrochloric acid. So if we open up a bottle of ammonium chloride and smell it, something that we're not recommended to do around the lab, but there are some food items, especially Swedish food items that use this as a flavoring agent. And we'll smell this uh, coming from the solid. So our equilibrium expression, again, we could, this is also a Kp. Uh, because all that's showing up in here are pressures. So we do our products, the um, ammonia gas times the pressure of the hydrogen chloride gas. We're dividing by a solid. Solids are gonna show up. So we can just replace the solid with a one and then we don't have to show the one. So the equilibrium constant is just the pressure of ammonia times the pressure of hydrogen chloride. Another one with a solid. So manganese two sulfate uh, decomposes with low heat to form Manganese to oxide plus sulfur trioxide gas. So our equilibrium constant, we do our product, our sulfur. Um, we put a one in here for the manganese oxides. We have a one there. And we put a one in for the manganese sulfate, another solid. So the solids are just gonna be ones. Uh, the ones don't show and we end up with our equilibrium constant just being equal to the pressure of the sulfur trioxide. Now, dissolving a solid into water. So the water is necessary for the process, 
but it's not showing up in as a reaction or a product. So we can just show it above or below the reaction arrow. So this is table sugar, sucrose. We dissolve in water and at some point it will stop dissolving. That's how we know that we have reached equilibrium is that we stir, we stir, we stir, and we can't get any more of this sugar to dissolve for us. That is our equilibrium point. That is called a satur saturated solution. So our product is a solution. So we do molarity for it. Our reactant is a solid. So we just put one. One doesn't show. So our equilibrium constant is equal to the concentration of the dissolved sugar. Now for a ionic compound, if, as we dissolve table salt into water, ionic compounds break into cations, positive ions, and anions, negative ions. So we have two products here, not just one for the covalent compound. So we have our concentration, molarity of sodium ions times our chloride ions. Our reactant is a solid, so we put in one. And one disappears, and we have the product of the two ions. So this is called a solubility product for dissolving a ionic compound into water. And again, this equilibrium only occurs when we have enough solid that it will not dissolve in water. We stir, we stir, we stir, and it does not dissolve water. And that's when we have our equilibrium there. So here we have um, ammonia gas dissolving in water to form aqueous ammonia. So we write this out. We have our concentration of the solution, concentration of the ammonia solution on top, dividing by the pressure of ammonia gas on bottom. That's equal to our equilibrium constant. And we actually use this equation in terms of it's called Henry's law, law of uh, how much pressure uh, of a gas above a solution will affect the concentration of the uh, gas in the solution. This gas in the solution takes another reaction step. The aqueous ammonia will react with water to form ammonium ion and hydroxide ion. This is a base reaction. So whenever we make a hydroxide ion in solution, we have a base. So the reaction that produces the hydroxide is a base reaction. So we can write this as Kb. So it'll be the products ammonium ion times hydroxide ion molarity divided by the aqueous ammonia concentration molarity. Water. Water is a pure substance. If we're in a dilute solution. So if we go concentrated enough uh, so uh, we affect the concentration of the water, then we have to include it in. But for most solutions, the concentration of the water is not affected by the other components. So as the pure liquid here, we do not show up. We could put it in as a, a one, and then we know that we don't need to keep showing the one, so they disappear from our equation. So we see this on the next reaction also, uh, aqueous hydrochloric acid in water, will react with water. So it donates the hydrogen from the acid, we call that a proton, to the water. We form the hydronium ion and the chloride uh, counter ion. So we have our products, the hydronium ion times chloride ion divided by the hydrogen chloride concentration. And again, the water being a, a liquid doesn't show up in our equation. We can put the one there, and then we see we don't need it, and we draw, erase the run, one out. Whenever we form the hydrogen ion or the hydronium ion in solution, this is an acid reaction. So we can use the subscript A to show that we're dealing with an acid reaction. I have one more board here. And a little more adjusting here. Yeah. Right. 
just in okay. Check the camera. Okay, so over here, a little mess moving this around. Uh, we have a silver iron reacting with cyanide to form another complex iron. Uh, so cyanide is one of the chemicals that we use to extract silver from ore. So to write our equilibrium expression, it'll be forming a complex iron. So Kf for formation constant. We have our product, the complex ion over the silver, over the cyanide squared. And then um, another type of question is what we call extent of reaction. How far does it go before it reaches equilibrium? So we look at the size of this exponent here. We have a, a large positive exponent, so we have a large value to this. So this is predominantly products. So the extent of the reaction just tells us quickly that, yes, we can use cyanide to extract silver from ore well, and it will get pretty much all of that silver out of the ore. And So here's, um, I use two reactions. So I have nitrogen plus hydrogen forming ammonia. This is the reaction that we do commercially to make ammonia as a fertilizer or to make it as a first step in additional fertilizers or products. The reverse reaction is taking the ammonia and helping to decompose into nitrogen and hydrogen. So first we'll just write the equilibrium expression. And I'm using a, a FOR for forward, REV for reverse. And um, so forward, we have our uh, pressure of nitrogen of ammonia squared divided by pressure of nitrogen times pressure of hydrogen cubed. And for the reverse reaction, we have our products, pressure of nitrogen times our pressure of hydrogen cubed divided by the pressure of ammonia uh, squared. And lower this slightly. One of our properties of equilibrium constants is that the, the equilibrium constant for the reverse reaction is the inverse of the forward reaction. So I reverse is one over forward. I take the forward, I substitute it in here. I just simplify this expression I end up getting the reverse reaction um, back out of it. So this is one of our relationships of equilibrium constants is a reversed equilibrium constant is one over the forward equilibrium constant. So let me look at extent of reaction. Um, the equilibrium constant changes with temperature. So um, for the decomposition reaction at room temperature, Equilibrium constant is 1.8 times 10 to the minus six. And again, these do not have units. Um, but we have a negative exponent that is not close to uh, zero. Uh, so an exponent of zero would be equilibrium constant of one. Um, so things that are close to one will have roughly similar amounts of products and reactants. And within an order of magnitude or so, you know, factor to 10, 1 tenth, we can also say that they are roughly similar. But when they get large or small, in this case, then we can say what is predominant. So in this case, it's small. Products is small. Reactants is large to give us a small equilibrium constant. So this is going to be primarily reactants.
But when we raise the temperature to a thousand degrees, now we have an exponent of five, a large exponent is positive. So to get that, we have a lot of products and very little reactants. So we are predominantly products. So you see that at room temperature, 298 degrees is 25 Celsius room temperature. Uh, this reaction, if it's going at all, favors our reactants. We're not going to decompose much. Generally, we're going to have a minimum temperature before we see any significant decomposition going on here. But um, unless we have a catalyst to make it easier, um, but by 1,000 degrees, we're going to be decomposing this uh, quite easily. Looking at the forward reaction, this reaction that we do commercially, trying to make our ammonia at room temperature, we have a uh, equilibrium constant of 5.6 times 10 to the fifth. So we have a large positive exponent. So we're gonna have a lot of product on this one. But by a thousand degrees Kelvin, these are all Kelvin temperatures, thousand degrees, the equilibrium constant is 2.8 times 10 to the minus six, very small. So very, a large negative exponent means a very small equilibrium constant. So this is predominantly reactants. And at room temperature, I don't expect to see any products being formed here. So we um, need to raise up the temperature to get the reaction to go. But if we raise up too much, we're not going to make much product. So again, to make this work, we use catalyst to make this work at the lowest temperature possible so we can favor our products. We skin them off the reaction vessel, and then we can keep the reaction going. 